you know, the magic of VR software is this feeling of presence, right? The feeling that you're really there with another person or in another place. The promise of VR is it's to make the world as you want it. It's quite transformative. Uh, you really feel like you're there. Um, and, and then when you come out of it, it feels like reality isn't real. People are constantly surprised at how real and how visceral it already feels. And we're only starting to scratch the surface of what's possible, possible, possible. Virtual reality is an emerging technology that isn't just changing the world, it's creating whole new worlds with unlimited potential. I want to take a look at how VR is being used and what it's currently capable of. What was once thought of as just a plot point in science fiction, virtual reality has become a widespread phenomenon with an estimated 171 million users as of 2018. And while in recent years VR has come a long way in terms of the technology and its availability, you may not realize how VR is already impacting your world. From the cars you drive, to the sports you watch on TV, to the stores you shop at, VR is changing the game for a number of different industries. In the automotive industry, Ford, Volkswagen, and Toyota all use VR to design and test cars as well as improve safety and efficiency in factories. In football, both college and national teams are using VR to review plays from a first-person perspective. Walmart has used VR to train employees and prepare them for events like Black Friday. Architects have started using VR to design buildings and experience them long before they come to fruition. Surgeons are using VR to practice and learn new procedures in a controlled environment. Therapists have used VR to tackle phobias and PTSD in groundbreaking ways. And police have used VR to train for high-risk operations, such as hostage situations, while also receiving real-time feedback and statistics on their performance, allowing them to be more prepared than ever before. But it's not just industries that are reaching new heights using virtual reality. Most people are aware of the various entertainment aspects of the technology, but consumers are also using VR to create art in whole new ways, to make exercising fun and sustainable, to meditate and relax, and to socialize with friends across the world. But virtual reality wasn't always what it is today. The modern definition of virtual reality is a computer-generated, three-dimensional, simulated experience. But the roots of VR were much more simplistic. One of the earliest recognized ancestors of VR is panoramic paintings. First popularized around the early 1800s, these paintings were designed to fill the viewer's entire field of view, making them feel as though they were present at a specific scene or event. The next big precursor development would be the stereoscope and stereoscopic photos developed by Charles Wheatstone in 1838. Using two images with offset points of view, the technique would create the illusion of depth. The principle behind the stereoscope and stereoscopy are still used today in modern VR headsets. Then in 1922 was the creation of the Link Trainer or Blue Box by Edward Link. The Link Trainer was the first ever flight simulator. It was entirely electromechanical, could simulate weather conditions and turbulence, and was used to train over 500,000 pilots in World War II. After that came the Sensorama by Morton Haleg in the 1950s. The Sensorama is one of the earliest forms of multimodal or multi-sensory technology and was an arcade cabinet style theater designed to fully immerse a viewer through the use of stereo speakers, stereoscopic film displays, fans, smell generators, and a vibrating chair. Morton Haleg would then also go on to invent the Telesphere Mask, which is the first example of a head-mounted display. However, unlike modern head-mounted displays, the Telesphere Mask lacked motion tracking or interactivity. 
Next would be the head sight created by two Philco Corporation engineers in 1961. The head sight had video screens for each eye and was the first head mounted display to have motion tracking, but was designed for immersive remote viewing and thus lacked the computer image generation elements of modern VR. This was followed by the Sword of Damocles, which was the first VR head-mounted display to be connected to a computer rather than a camera. However, the Sword of Damocles was massive and required the user to be strapped in. After the Sword of Damocles, there were many small improvements to VR, especially in reducing the size, but attempts to bring VR into the mainstream would be met with one commercial failure after another, including the Sega VR1, Nintendo Virtual Boy, Forte VFX1 headgear, and the Sony Glastron. And it was starting to look like the dream of an immersive, commercially available VR system was dead. But then, there was a breakthrough. My name is Palmer Lucky, and I'm a virtual reality enthusiast and the designer of the Rift. The Oculus Rift was one of the most successful Kickstarter campaigns ever, raising 2.4 million and showing the world that there was a market for VR. On top of that, Palmer Lucky had tackled huge challenges with the Oculus Rift, such as having a wide field of view, high resolution displays, and ultra low latency head tracking. And while Lucky and the Rift did permanently change the landscape of virtual reality, there's one industry that played a particularly large role in the growth and viability of VR. Gaming. The video gaming industry offered financial incentive as one of the largest entertainment industries with a worldwide market value of $159 billion in 2020. Combined with having the resources and talent necessary to make convincing interactive 3D environments, the gaming industry was a natural fit for VR. And with games continuously striving for greater levels of immersion and realism, the integration of VR felt inevitable. Which is why when Palmer Lucky brought the Oculus Rift to gaming industry leaders such as Valve, Unity, and Epic Games, they were all eager to support the movement. Valve in particular even went on to work with HTC to create a competing headset in 2014, the HTC Vive, and then their own VR headset, the Valve Index, in 2019. And it's no coincidence that the previously mentioned headsets, as well as PlayStation VR, the Vive Cosmos, the HP Reverb, and the Oculus Quest have all been heavily marketed towards gaming. It's safe to say that VR would not be as widely available or affordable if it wasn't for the investment of gamers and the gaming industry. VR has been through quite the journey, but I wanted to talk with someone in the industry about their thoughts on the future of VR. Hey, I'm Catherine. I am the community manager slash game designer for Toast VR with the makers of Richie's Plank Experience. Tony and Richard really wanted to create something that could show off VR in a really short time frame and something that would excite our friends and family as much as we were excited to try VR. At Toast, we kind of have a little saying. Um, in regards to the future of VR is that we anticipate that it will outlast things like phones, screens, all those other things that we kind of take for granted right now, we expect that it'll outlast that. So that makes it really cool for us to be here at the very start of it. Personally, I think having controller-free um, interaction is really cool. Like that's awesome to me, but more importantly, it will having like really good voice input that works consistently will probably change the game quite a lot. Not so much in terms of entertainment and games, but in terms of using it for health, learning, exercise, enterprise, education, all that stuff. Something that's coming, that's coming, but like it'd still be really awesome to see it is really good facial recognition because that will improve our kind of our social experience in VR. One thing that VR kind of lacks is the social aspect of it. Cause you know, you're in your headset, it's hard for you to interact with people around you or people, you know, on the other end of whatever game you're playing. So having facial recognition allows you to, you know, be emotive with someone and you can communicate with them better. So I expect that we'll get some kind of integration with AR. Um, eventually, it'll definitely become much smaller and highly integrated with our daily lives. So there's probably, I reckon, this is my theory, it'll probably be in the form of glasses. And, 
you know, this probably won't be for another 10 years, um, but it'll be something that we interact with on a daily basis and it will like be part of us. Something that I learned coming through my game design education is that um, the benefits that you get from learning through play, even as adults, is super, super valuable. And I'm hoping that um, when VR becomes a bit more mainstream, we'll get more of that benefit coming out of VR. I'm, it's, it's really exciting for me to see like students and, and like sort of the next wave of people that will probably be part of our industry um, working this kind of thing. So well done and good luck. And the journey for VR is far from over. The technology is just gonna get better and the role plays in our lives more prevalent. It's time to start thinking about how VR can offer innovative solutions to modern problems. If you've yet to try out VR, I encourage you to seek out the opportunity and experience a new reality. Thanks for watching.